and welcome to the round table number 47. We're going to be discussing all kinds of interesting things that are going on around the world with my two wonderful guests. I'm joined by Larry Johnson, late of the CIA. Larry, how's it going, my friend? I am well. Good to be with you all. It's, it's great to have you back on. Larry, as you all know, is one of the usual suspects that we have on all the time. And making his maiden debut on the round table is Professor Michael Vlahos. Uh, Michael is a big brain. He's a, a professor at Johns Hopkins. He's also taught at the Naval War College, and he has some extremely interesting views and insights into the geopolitical situation. And just so that you know, he's on the realist side of the Great Divide. So, Michael, it's a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure uh, is all mine. And that was that Maiden or Maidan, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, maiden. Hang on, let me turn on the lights here because it's it's just as we're starting, it's kind of starting to get dark here. So anyway, uh, so the big news today is that, um, well, yesterday, Joe Biden went to Kiev, you know, and he went and he hugged Zelensky just as the air raid siren was going off, even though there was no missile attack or anything of the sort, just, you know, to well, give a put, little, you know. put on the red mark the way he was supposed to. Yeah, yeah, just to give a little bit of local color, as it were. And um, today we had a very big speech by Vladimir Putin. And uh, I watched the, the, the show live. Larry, you know, he's in Florida seven hours ahead or, or after, rather. And so it was like four in the morning. So Larry was a wimp. He just read the speech as opposed to watching it. But anyway, it's uh, we're going to be discussing that. We're also going to be discussing the military situation in uh, Ukraine and um, and anything else that we find interesting. So, uh, Larry, I'll throw it to you. What did you think of the speech? Um, Putin is laying down a marker mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they're not going to play, uh, trust the United States and the West anymore, uh, calling the United States out correctly as the true imperial power by virtue of its hundreds of military bases scattered around the world, in contrast that Russia does not have such a presence around the world. Um, I thought his, it, it, he was being very clear about, we're going to, uh, I, I ordered, issued a decree last week, putting all of our nuclear forces on combat alert. They are prepared to, to fight. And then in, in the context of that, they called in the U.S. ambassador today in Moscow and told her, uh, one, get all of your equipment and stop making deliveries to Ukraine. Uh, I think that is it's just both ominous, but it's it's appropriate from Russia's standpoint. Uh, he, I think it, it was Putin's sending the clear message: their patience is is over with the West. They haven't closed off the possibility of talks, but it's going to be done more on Russia's terms as opposed to Russia coming hat in hand. Um, I, I think the um, the other thing that struck me as well was his his comments about the family cultural issues. Yeah. He says, uh, and he recognized it as a universal religious principle, not just confined to Christianity, but to Judaism and to Islam, that uh, marriage is a relationship between men and women, and that he is uh, eschewing the, the West's descent into this debauchery called transgender uh, you know, you know, fantasy. That's all you can describe it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I thought the same thing. I, also, I, was, I was also really surprised uh, when he pretty much closed the door on any kind of strategic nuclear talks. Uh, basically, his rationale was, you know, the, the U.S. has openly declared that it wants to uh, uh, <clears throat> denigrate uh, uh, or, or, or depreciate uh, Russia's forces and basically break up Russia. And so why should we allow American inspectors to show up uh, to our military bases when on top of that, they don't allow Russian observers to go to their military bases. Uh, but he so said he, he used the word suspend. So he didn't yeah. he didn't kill it, but he said yeah. it's suspended. Yeah, and the also the other thing that I um, that I noted, unfortunately I don't have my notes in front of me. That was stupid of me. But um, the, the uh, yeah he suspended the, the 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 issue and also he opened the door for nuclear testing, which I found very deeply troubling because he said that Russia would not do nuclear tests unless the United States started doing their own nuclear tests, right. and then that they would also do nuclear tests. Um, he was phrased it much more elegantly than I'm doing now, but 
I, I was really surprised at that. He must have some sort of intelligence indicating that the Americans want to do nuclear testing. Um, or he's or he's laying down a marker. In, in many ways, um, his um, declaration that Russia may in fact renew testing uh, is not necessarily linked to any indication that the U.S. may soon be testing, but rather it's an alternative way to bring up the nuclear issue without appearing to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. So right. um, in the past, you've seen in Putin's speeches, as soon as he mentions nuclear weapons, the West instantly goes into he's Sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself. Go on. As, as soon Go. as he mentions um, nuclear weapons in any context and in any way, no matter how you know, subtle or elated the um, uh, insertion of the word nuclear is, um, the Western media instantly accuses him of threatening use of nuclear weapons. So this may be a more elegant way to introduce the fact that um, there are pathways of slow incremental escalation uh, that lead up to eventual nuclear use. And he nicely puts it on the U.S. saying, if they test, then we may have to test. So I thought he's come up with rhetorical um, constructions that allow him to, uh, that makes it harder for the Western media to distort what he's saying. Although they've already distorted his comments on culture, I, I made sure and look at all of the commentary on his speech, and it was just loaded with... Um, uh, characterizations that he, in fact, didn't make. And when it came to what Larry was pointing out, I thought was a really rather uh, spot on analysis of what's going on in the U.S. in terms of what we call here the culture wars. It's really much deeper and more um, dangerous than a culture war. It is an attempt to transform the society into um uh, something that has never been done before in human society. And it, it's it's terribly uh, dangerous and risky. And yeah. and he manages to characterize it, I think, pretty pretty fairly. And it's a pretty biting criticism. So one of the things, yeah. uh, if I may add, just one, one of the other things that, that's really intriguing is that I, I read through his speech on February 21st, 2022. And that was a really magnificent <gasps> speech. And he laid out uh, the history, I thought, beautifully. And I had never read that speech. And no one, again, in Western social and so-called news media has ever mentioned the substance of that speech, which was not a uh, rationalization of the special military operation, but a very uh, point by point laying out of all of the history that led up to this. It was a lot, it had the feeling of, say, Khrushchev's uh, speech on the crimes of Stalin, remember his secret speech? And, and I thought it was, you know, I was very impressed by that. And, and uh, uh, just one more thing is that his speech was kind of like a State of the Union address in the sense that it went up and down this boring checklist of all the things he was doing domestically for Russia. And I think that's important because it tends to lower the um, uh, the thermometer or the uh, anxiety level, uh, it's basically he's putting the special military operation in the entire war in the context of a regular old address to the nation about what needs to be done in Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And in that sense, I think he really caught the West off guard because here he is just talking about normal things that the president needs to do and all the rest. And, and it takes it away from the threats and bluster. And it shows a Putin to be this reasoned uh, the leader of his people in contrast to the shrill and near hysterical language that you saw throughout the Munich Security Conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was the thing that struck me about the speech was that it was uh, the our air raid siren went off finally. But when they when they go off, they're actually shooting missiles here. But anyway, uh, yeah. what I, what I found interesting about uh, the 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 speech was yeah, it, it, it's kind of like uh, sort of like a ho hum thing. I was expecting anything, you know, anything from yeah. you know yeah. 
declaring war on Ukraine to saying now is the big offensive and you know a million man army is going to sweep through Ukraine or anything to as to just say basically oh we're going to continue the SMO as we've been doing but he actually didn't say anything about the SMO uh, as uh, in so far as how it's going to be conducted he he talked much more about the diplomatic and political aspects of the reaction of the west and and the other thing i i sensed or i felt implied in the speech and and i want to get your your comments on it larry is that there seemed to be an implication that the relationship with europe especially is just over i mean like permanently over yeah and that was the sense i got sort of like underlying it never explicitly stated but underlying the entire speech do you think i'm misreading it no i but i would note that putin at one point referred to this special military operation as a war so yes. this is uh, i think what we're seeing is a is, is a change that change in rhetoric is not inconsequential it's not an accident yeah. uh, i think uh, putin is very precise in his language uh, what he's what he's trying to say uh, he at one point in the speech i wish i uh, I'll, I'll find it at some point and quote it i'll write about it but he, he referred to Russia, particularly in the 19 post uh, collapse of the Soviet Union period, as being a little bit like um, the rug merchants in a bazaar in Turkey trying to sell stuff to, to uh, foreigners, to tourists. Right. And then he turned around and said, no, nah, we're not playing that anymore. We're, we're not here to go out and really pour ourselves to the West. We're going to do it our way, and we're going to set. We're going to develop an economy that's real. I thought that was, you know, I thought that was quite important. Well, it shows how stung he must have been by McCain's comment about Russia dismissing it as a, a gas station with nukes. Right. So you know, but I, it, it is the prevailing uh, Western judgment that yeah. this was barely a country and no more, no, no stronger economically than Italy. And if you do even a PPP comparison, it's twice the GNP yeah. of Italy. Plus, it's got much more manufacturing and uh, other real things in it. It's not as financialized as Western economies. So that that's really something, I, I really don't know how we miss that. Plus, you have all the state-run uh, infrastructure to, to make weapons and other military things. And we just sort of forgot that. And the most outrageous thing that, that marks the past year was the reporting every week or so that Russia was running out of missiles or about to run out of <laughs> shells or tanks. Oh, look, they're using T-64s. I'm thinking, oh, no. It's, it's just remarkable how we have deceived ourselves uh, ourselves as an alliance, but also the, the imperial court in Washington. Uh, there's no excuse for that kind of, of self-deception. Well, well, actually, I, I Michael, argue, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you because you were on a broadcast and you said that uh, Russia's Maskarova has been provided uh, by the yeah. West itself. Can you, can you expand on that comment? I thought it was brilliant. Well, I mean, th there's there's so many cliches uh, that we hold as deep truths about Russia, and they're really more reflections on us. And so we love to keep banding about the term Maskirovka, and and it's really not a it's not just a term, it, it's a way of thinking. And for us to have entered into a position where our government is is its major focus and its expenditure of, en of uh, its energy is on trying to uh, deceive. He went, on, uh, he went on mute because of the air raid sirens. Yeah, yeah, I figured. Anyway, I'll, uh, is he still hearing me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep going. Okay, good. I, I, my sense is that th there's been a long transition where the U.S. has become more and more like the old Soviet Union in many, many ways. Yes. And I, so I yes. Agree. it is not unsurprising that the way it treats its people should also be like the Soviet Union, which put enormous efforts into propaganda, of course, as we all remember. But the, the idea of the U.S. putting most of its energy, here I mean the U.S. government, most of its energy on a giant uh, 
propaganda op against its own people is is uh, remarkable. And of course, it had, I think, its origins in the, um, what were they called? The on message uh, generals. It was, oh, um, something force multipliers, message force multipliers. I think that was. Yeah, I saw that, that. I remember. Yeah, I remember the term. Yeah. Go on. GWA. And, and so you had all these generals going on, ex generals, former generals, sorry, uh, going on uh, media and lying every day consistently all the time but that was about a very narrow issue of the iraq war they did it later with afghanistan of course but i mean this is like the full spectrum deception at every possible level and um it it's it's incredibly worrisome for the future because just as the soviet union fell because people ceased to believe in it you know the era of stagnation and no longer at the end of that era had any legitimacy left and could not exert its authority at all, you know, even with a BMP trying to crash into the parliament building. Uh, uh, it, it just fell apart because it the people lost trust in the system completely and refused to give it their loyalty in any way. And I think the, the U.S. is is down going down that road right now. And so uh, I, I'm... I'm just stupefied by the, an entire year of lying. It, 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 it's a kind of astonishment that never goes away. You know, I, I don't mean to use heated rhetoric, but I, I had this discussion with a friend. The reality is America is now the quintessential fascist state. If, <laughs> if, fascism, if fascism is defined as the the union of government and corporations and well, at that point if they're so intertwined and it's the relationship is so incestuous it's tough to figure out who's on top because that's a very good point yeah the corporations yield uh, you know wield a quite a bit of power the government as well favors those particular corporations and the well, difference can, between yeah. fascism yeah. And communism is that in, in a true communist state where the state owns all of the means of production and control, and there is no such thing as private property. But, but the reality is those two systems, they right. both fight against religion. They both attack religion right. because they both, in both systems, they must be, the government must be the god. Because well, if people yeah. if people apply to religion, they have another god than government, and that is a threat to True. those kinds of systems. Yeah, right. they try and to reinvent the people in their image, right? Th this was interesting I mean, because the Soviet the, man, you know, the, the the Aryan Superman, you know, uh, and now we have the the pink haired wokester. That's the model that this particular regime has. Well, the, 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 uh, there there aren't any actually good definitions of fascism that you can find among the media. They right. give you the, the just whatever feels good at the moment in terms of whatever their agenda is and whatever their goals are. The, but fascism, as we saw it codified, you know, let's say Italy and Germany, um, it, it's interesting because the, there's the cult of the leader. There is a party, meaning there's a defined elite that controls politics and it's all around the leader, but the leader can be, um, well, I mean, in, in the 30s, the leaders weren't puppets by any means, but, you know, you can have fascism with a, a weaker leader as well. And the, the, um, the, the tightness between the party and the corporation is very important. Control of social media is a, 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 always a distinctive characteristic. Yeah. And the relative passivity of the people. And when it comes to religion, it's not so much the Soviets tr were trying to crush Christ Christianity. Um, Mussolini and, um, uh, you know, Franco, quite the opposite, because those were different cultures. But in Germany, um, there was an agreement made with the Pope between the Nazi state and the papacy. And it, 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 it found ways to allow religion so that it wouldn't... Uh, too, too badly destroy the the harmony and, and the uh, love people had for 
for the Nazi party and Hitler, the, the, the leader. And uh, yet the goal of the state was subversive to undermine uh, Christianity's hold over time. And that you can see that in all sorts of policies that were pursued before the war. So that is exactly what's happening now is that only approved Christianity is acceptable and it has to essentially uh, bow down to the the worldview, the 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 liturgy, if you will, of the state church, which is the Church right. of Woke, and um, at the same time, by having um, the official church or the approved church of old time religion bow down, and by creating a compact between what what is allowed and what is an anointed as acceptable religion. It, it means that all other forms of religion are potentially to be proscribed. They are now white supremacist religions, including the FBI pursuing um, a course of, of uh, what I don't even know what to call it, but they're going after uh, what they call uh, far right Tradition. Catholic expressions. I mean, they're Traditional really targeting Catholics. Traditional Catholics. Yeah, and, of course, yeah. and they don't have to do evangelicals uh, like Baptists anymore because they're all ipso facto white supremacists. So it's a very strange um, uh, uh, dynamic. And, and the one remaining element that's most important to fascism is there has to be an enemy. Uh, and the enemy has to be um, inherently evil by its very nature by you know what what it is not 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 what it may be doing and and ergo you have in nazi germany of course you have the jews and then to some extent the slavs although that's a, a mixed bag and very complicated but uh here you know you have a, a, a similar target that is to be uh suspect because of who they are not for anything they might have done politically and the other elemental aspect of the evil other is that there is an other that is foreign and then there is an other that is domestic and they're connected so that in other words you know whatever the f is going on in Russia is mirrored by the same kind of dangerous traditionalists uh you know white yeah, men Trump was a Trump was a Russian agent traditional society yeah and and so he and, and th this is very much um, in, in the mold of, of fascism. And uh, in fact, it, it has many similarities to the, uh, the Red Scare in the US in the 50s. But it, it's, you know, this is definitely the, uh, the playbook that blue America is, or the blue elite America, I should say, is operating under. Yeah, one of the things I, I would I would agree with, I completely agree with your, your notion that it is a fascist state with its own state religion that uh, suppresses any other competing religion. I would certainly agree with that. Uh, but I would also add uh, to your point earlier, Michael, that uh, it's like a late Brezhnev stage empire because you have a gerontocracy. You have these elderly people who are completely out of touch. Yeah. Uh, that, that you have no idea like what's going late on. Soviet Union, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and that, that is the part that is true. Right. Yeah, and because, like, for instance, when we talk about the Nord Stream bombing, it turns out that it was Biden himself who was adamant about uh, destroying the, um, the pipeline, uh, you know, per Seymour Hersh's article, which, by the way, uh, it still has not appeared either in CNN, the BBC website, the New York Times website, or the Washington Post website. And this is a yeah. major piece of investigative journalism that the Germans are, are finally starting to talk about it, you know, uh, very tentatively, so like tiptoeing towards it, uh, but they are tiptoeing nevertheless towards it. And, and in the mainstream media in the United States, they are not saying anything, but it, it, it seems ideologically, yes, it is a fascist state that's trying to create a new society on the one hand and has an mm -hmm. identified enemy that is both internal and external and that they are connected. You know, Russia, Putin's agents. By the way, all three of us are Putin agents. You know, I, I, I don't think that either one of you have gotten any checks yet because, you know, I, I yeah, have I'm not. Still, I'm still waiting for mine. I, I call the Kremlin and those are that. They, they send me here, there. I talked to Shoigu. I talked to Lavrov. They say talk to Peskov. Peskov doesn't know, you know, bastards. Anyway, in, in some, a serious uh, issue here, the, the, the serious Twitter, issue. Uh, 
yeah, some the, Twitter the, account the better is, piece of that say, oh, I'm paid in vodka. <laughs> you know, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're pursuing the that that so the of, vodka uh, strategy. Yeah, obvious. But no, but the serious yeah. problem is that because of this uh, uh, closed off information system, where any kind of demon right. view is not expressed. The, the opposition, the dissidents, uh, has no idea, number one, it's numbers. It's actual numbers. Uh, right. And number two, it has no way whatsoever of making itself heard. And so the, the regime in the West, because let's not kid ourselves, it's not a democracy. It has not been a democracy for quite some time. We're really in the era of a, of a, a bureaucratic regime that controls uh, the Western democracies. And they are all, it's a cosmopolitan elite where everybody went to the same schools or similar schools. They all went to mm -hmm. the same think tanks and all the rest of it. And so you have this cosmopolitan leadership class that is completely detached from reality. And they themselves think that the bubble they are living in is fully informed as to what's actually going on, which I think is the, the terrible part, because I think that they're going to be just as surprised as the common people in the West when this war all of a sudden turns, the, the Ukrainian armed forces will at some point simply collapse because of the <laughs> catastrophic losses of men and material. And That's the Russians happened. just sweep through. And I think that, that that shock to the system might lead to one of two outcomes. Either the system itself starts to just simply crumble, as happened in the Soviet Union, or in their panic, they hit the big, big red button. I mean, that's, well, that's my yeah. concern at this point. Is this, Do you think that this is a reasonable concern and a reasonable outlook into the future as to what might happen? Well, you you, you um, describe um, the uh, elite culture, the ruling class, as I would like to put it nicely. Uh, and yet there's another dimension, which is crucial, I think, to understanding uh, the long... Uh, sort of litany of, of failure and uh, inability to, to make a, a clear assessment of actual reality. And that is that it's a monoculture. Um, the U.S. is always run by elites and the U.S. has never been a, a true democracy. It's had, a, it's had a kind of plebiscitory democracy in the earlier period leading up to the Civil War with high participation rates, but it was <clears throat> the electorate was often very manipulated. But I mean, the, the fact is, it doesn't matter uh, whether we're a democracy, we were a republic. And uh, there were lots of different subcultures and different, you know, as they like to say today, lived experiences, but you had a, a really polyglot uh, tapestry of a nation. And that helped to make it far more pluralistic. And, um, you know, lots of raucous debates and conflict, but what you have today is a unitary elite. So when you identify they all went to the same schools, that means the same schools all over the country. I mean, there, there was a time, if you read like Henry James and go back to the 1890s, there was a ruling class and they all went to the same schools and they were very narrowly focused, but there were all these other elites all over the country and they, they made their, you know, their, their weight felt and in politics. And what we have today, though, is a, um, a monoculture of, of belief and of thought, and there, are, there is no uh, diversity allowed. And so everything is the opposite of, of the rhetoric and the language that is used to describe it. And it, that, that's very dangerous because they, they cannot, they're, they're, the bubble is real in, in the sense of, of holding uh, of, of keeping the membrane uh, unpunctured uh, so that no. the, the data that needs to come in, the knowledge they need to acquire can't get in. And they, they, it's, it, everything is self-referent. You know, the old echo chamber metaphor, it, 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 it's, it's come true. And it means that, that it's almost impossible uh, for uh, new thinking and for, for good analysis to actually happen. Yeah, but what you know, will happen when reality crashes in? Larry, I'm sorry. Well, we've, we've, we've really entered a, a, a new phase in history, I believe. And I'm, I'm going back to, so I'll take you back to when I was an analyst sitting at the CIA in 1986. Yeah. And I could see the disconnect between the intelligence, what we were really seeing take place in the, in the ground war in Nicaragua and El Salvador. 
and then right. what was being reported in the press. But at least back then, uh, and I came to realize very early that as long as there was agreement, consensus between the executive branch and the intelligence agencies and the Department of Defense, that nothing leaked. But once there was disagreement or an mm -hmm. issue in which there were at least two, two sort of distinct sides, then that would leak out. And at that time, you still had an independent media that was right. not beholden to corporate interests and not easily controlled True. or threatened. So that's why Cy Hirsch back then uh, you know, really established his credentials because he was able to publish the stories in the New York Times. And we even go back to the, the, the period when it went 69 with the publishing of the Pentagon Papers, where Washington Post and the New York Times and a variety of other papers you know, united to oppose the government's attempt to quash them. If that happened, if, if, if that kind of revelation came today, they would quash it in a heartbeat. Right. Well, we can be... Uh, let me just finish this point. Sure, I sorry. liken it to a, a disease. And a disease, if you are sick with cancer, there are symptoms that manifest themselves to right. give some indication that there's something wrong with your body. And what's wrong with our body right now is where we began the discussion about the self-deception. When, when you have a, a governing elite that insists that just because declares themselves a potato, they are a potato, which is, it's no difference to say I'm a potato than to say that I'm a woman, because right. I can't be either. It's just biologically impossible. Those same people say Russia's run out of weapons. Those same people say Russia is a weak sister and we'll crush her uh, immediately. And oh, by the way, we have the strongest army in the world. We got the best army in the world. No. We got the most expensive army in the world. It's, it's like a Lamborghini that doesn't run. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, uh, when I was in the CIA for a very short time, but a happy time, it was about a decade before. And one of the things that I found most interesting, I was in the, you know, analysis side, was that um, there was which division? Two, which division? Oh, I was actually in the Soviet Navy branch, which I oh. had a lot of fun in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we should bring Andre Martinov. I didn't know that. that we should bring Andre. The best ships were being built. Uh, the, you know, it was, it was a really peak peak time for Russia yeah. in terms of, of its uh, maritime uh, enterprise. But what, what was so interesting was the constant battles that were going on between on one hand, naval intelligence, then the DIA, and then, of course, the CIA was supporting the president, who was Jimmy Carter. And uh, there were just fierce battles about what was going on in the Soviet Union when it came to, you know, their strategy and their actual capabilities and what they might build in the future. And I thought that was all very healthy. And I, I you know, it, it's kind of creepy to see the CIA go from being uh, a, a, an alternative voice among many trying to figure out what's going on to really being an action figure. You know, um, I don't even know how big uh, it, its irregular forces are now, what they called back then paramilitary, but it must be pretty big and a lot of it's in Ukraine and it's become another arm of the armed forces. You've had this weird... Um, symbiotic uh, meshing of the intelligence community with the military. And both of them have become the, uh, you know, pieces on the chessboard for the chief executive. It, it, this war is, is his war, or if Hillary had been elected, it would have been her war. And right. the, everything since 2001 has been like that. And uh, the AUMF was signed, uh, passed and signed, and has never been it's still in effect. So basically, like an old emperor or, say, the Sun King in the 17th century, the, the executive, the emperor, can, can have his own wars. And, and he can grandly refer to <coughs> whole of government uh, enterprise. Well, whole of government means whole of executive branch. And it's, yeah. it's 
sh it's shocking. It, it really is like being in the 18th century or before. But there's one point I'd have to emphasize that there is a, a surprising voice of reason in all of this, which is the Pentagon. Because uh, I think that uh, this is a supposition, but I suspect that the, um, the fact that the Pentagon said, hey, we don't have any more artillery yeah. to send to Ukraine. We're running out. We, we'd actually be hurting ourselves by sending any more because we're going to need some of this stuff ourselves, potentially. I think that the Pentagon, uh, because of the hard military reality that is unfolding on the ground here in Ukraine, is the only one that's putting the stops and potentially putting in little nuggets of truth into the echo chamber of the regime. Because everything that, that you said, Michael, happened. I would agree. I, I mean, it, the State Department, CIA, uh, um, the, uh, you know, the, the White House, they're all on this, in, this, in this bubble that is impermeable to any true information about the reality, except the Pentagon, which has to say, hey, we can't send you know, uh, 3 million, 5 million shells to Ukraine because we don't have them. And, and I think that that might be the, the start of the, the pricking of that bubble. I think it must have been a, quite a shock to people like Victoria Newland who, uh, and Anthony Blinken, who assumed that the American military was monstrous and had it all. And, you know, General Miley showing up and say, hey, we can't send any more shells because we ain't got them. Uh, do you think that this might have played into their, might be helping to bring them down to reality? You know, Larry, what do you think? think? Well, oh, go ahead, Larry. I, I think the uh, I, I think you're giving the Pentagon way too much credit, DOD. Um, the, they will. I'm a, they, I'm a charitable they, sort. What can I say? Of course you are. You kind-hearted person, you know. But um, when you saw Milley the other day give his speech, where he said that Russia has been strategically, operationally, tactically defeated, <laughs> at that at that point, the question you ask. Hey, whatever drugs he's using, I want some. This is the ultimate, you know, fantasy. I mean, it's complete hallucination. I know uh, a guy in Alexandria. I know a guy yeah. in Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> this is, so, I mean, it was, you know, that's Millie should have come up and said, you know, if, if he was a true professional, he would resign his commission step down and say we cannot allow this to go forward you have never seen that in the last 30 years of uh the military and in, in terms of our engagements in iraq going on to there in afghanistan you know for example the withdrawal from afghanistan at no point did any of the senior knowledgeable military commanders say this is this is suicidal what you're talking about doing there's a right, right way to do it in the wrong way i'm going to resign and speak out didn't do that so they, they, be, they are compromised, fully economically and professionally compromised that they must support this. And I think that they are, they have sown, you know, it's, it's very sort of Hegelian. They have sown the seeds of their own destruction. The Americans need to recognize, and I don't, of course, I don't know how to get this across to Americans. Nobody does. Uh, every, there are a whole group of us and others trying, but one of the critical things that happened to the military uh, after 2001 is that on one hand, it redefined war as um, any situation in which America had total control or total supremacy. And it was really more and more and more like a SWAT team exercise, but we still called it war. Mm -hmm. The, at the same time that was happening, you had the military become increasingly more of a lifestyle-oriented uh, culture. So the, 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 the prime directive in the defense world is to maintain its lifestyle, its people, the money. And of course, that includes all the defense industries. It, it, it's, it's a hive. It's, it's a complete world. And um, it... There's no separating the defense industries from the actual active duty servicemen or any of the military affiliated uh, agencies and departments. So it, 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 it is going to follow orders no matter what they are because it wants to maintain this way of life. And in return, the executive um, makes the proper assurances that they'll get all the things they need. Meanwhile, and this is really interesting, we were fighting what basically amounted to, to SWAT team exercises. They were very costly. 
And many of my students at the War College had been deployed uh, seven, eight times to, to these countries. And at every, the, the, the actual minority of people in the, the services who actually fight was getting extremely tired and, and worn down. And so I think you have um, a, an awareness now in, in the Pentagon. Suddenly, I think it's kind of a shock, too, that things didn't go the way we thought they would, uh, mostly because we completely misassessed what, what the uh, special military operation was about and how it was working, and, and immediately fell back on uh, cherished Cold War stereotypes, uh, of, of the, or I should say, Post Cold War stereotypes that emerged of Russians, basically a kind of a country of Yeltsins, and the result has been that the, the military, I think, is incredibly aware today that they don't have the people. Uh, obviously, as Gonzalo mentioned, we don't have the the weapon stocks because we've we've never spent the money on readiness that we ever should have, and we never had to because how many artillery? Shells were we expending in Afghanistan or Iraq? Very few. Yeah. I mean, the, the 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 artillery was the Air Force, and it it it, it was just astonishing. I was on the firing line uh, for the uh, Ronald Reagan. I was advising the the CAG commander, and I was there the whole time that they were, you know, uh, in, in the uh, um, Arabian Sea, desultorily going out there sortie after sortie looking for Taliban. And so in the entire, whatever it was, four or five weeks on the firing line, they expended something like 60 Mark 82 bombs and 20,000 rounds of 20 millimeter cannon ammo. I mean, it's almost nothing. I mean, it, it and it creates over time fighting wars like that, the impression that you know, we're we're not only on top, but we're gods of war and no one can touch us. And we don't know what a real war is like when we're hit with war. And now I think it's sinking in and it, it's abetted by the fact that uh, the military can't meet its goals, recruiting goals now. And it, it's, a you know, with, with, yeah, uh, about that point, you know, it, one of the things that really struck me at the start of this war were all of these uh, American veterans who came here as volunteers. And they were thinking, oh, I'm gonna, you know, kill some Russians, and it'll be great, you know, great stories I can tell back home. Oh yeah. And they got yeah. one taste of Russian artillery, and they ran for the hills. I mean, they got right. the hell out of Dodge. It, it was remarkable. And yeah. and some of these soldiers that were, they put up TikTok videos, especially. I mean, all kinds of you know social media stuff that you know not, was not picked up by the mainstream media, but was all over Telegram. And these guys were basically saying, you know, this is this is not Iraq, this is not Afghanistan, this is shit that we cannot deal with. Where's the air cover? Where's this? Where's that? I mean, they were like, I mean, really shocked. And I I thought to myself that that would sort of like percolate up, but uh, to the to the American uh, military leadership cadres. But obviously not. Obviously, they they still have this bizarre notion that they can somehow take on the Russians. And uh, you know, to expand the conversation a little bit. What I am seeing, uh, you know, it's that it seems as if the Americans are slowly positioning Poland to be the next proxy, to be the next sacrificial victim to the Russians. And they're goading the, the Poles and, and potentially giving the, the Polish leadership the OK to go into Western Ukraine. And, you know, the Russians are going to kick the shit out of them. I mean, sorry for being so vulgar, but that's it's, it's not more complicated than that. They are really going to hurt the Poles yeah. because they've said anybody who crosses into Ukraine territory is fair game. And so I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, th this is insane. This this war could escalate very quickly, especially mm -hmm. if there is a sudden breakthrough by the Russians that sends the West into a complete panic. They're already panicking now. I mean, at the Munich conference, uh, you know, Annalena Baerbock with her 360 degree uh, comment, you know, that was particularly yeah. amusing, but uh, going back to where she started. Yeah, yeah they, but they, you know, were, they were nervous. Just Larry? a data point here. I've heard the Poles have already suffered uh, 2,500 killed yeah. in action. Yeah. They've had up to 20,000 troops, you know, in yeah. in Ukraine in the already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the number yeah. I've heard is sixteen thousand, but sixteen to twenty, you know, it's a ballpark. Oh, that, yeah. that's a, that, that's a good corroboration because that means that that the kinds of things we've been hearing tend to uh, support each yeah. other, and that that's yeah. always important. Uh, yeah. th I've seen um, news programs in in Poland where they put up maps of the post-war order and all of the oblasts that were once part of Poland are now again part of Poland. Poland is the winner in this war. The greater Poland is recreated. Poles need no encouragement from the US. They're, they're the most eager um, aggrandizers. And it, it's very interesting because they're, they're displaying some of the same behavior that they did uh, the, you know, the Resh Pospolita Polska did in 1930s, you know, after Pilsudski died. I mean, that this not uh, completely living in an illusion. And yeah. so it, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Anyway, Larry, I wanted no. to ask you if, uh, if, if you can corroborate some of this for me, because I've heard it from other um, veterans of uh you know, Langley McLean. And, and that is that in the process of getting actual intel to the top, it has to go through a several filters. So, you know, there are people briefing up to a certain level, then up to the assistant secretary, then et cetera, et cetera. And by the time it reaches the very top leadership, whatever that is in America today, it has been uh, diluted enough so that it is basically able to tell the leader or whatever the group is uh what the leader wants to hear um there's always sort of been that filter i mean back back when i was uh, an analyst uh on the honduran uh, uh, desk the sole uh analyst everything you know everything i would write would go through my branch chief then it would go through my division chief then it would go up to the front office of Africa, Latin America at that, at that office level. And then yeah. it would go up. So you, you go through these stages of review and editing. Uh, and in the process of that as well, you had to coordinate with other agencies, such as, yeah. as you pointed out, DIA, INR. I mean, I was in battles constantly with DIA and with uh, the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Um, but what has changed is back in that still back in the 80s there was a, a active collection of legitimate human sources yes. and yeah. what, what the agency has shifted to is relying almost exclusively on huh. liaison reporting so we no uh, longer will necessarily have a source based uh, uh, somewhere embedded within the russian uh yeah. foreign ministry yeah. or the pentagon we rely instead upon uh, Ukraine says that they have one, so we'll take their report and and and, and, and present that. So that that's part of the problem. There there has always been this pressure, and I think you know you encountered it as well as an analyst. Uh, I was I had the privilege of my new analyst course was headed by George Allen, and not mm -hmm. not the not the football coach, but George yeah. Allen, who was the head of. Uh, the Southeast uh, Viet, you know, the Southeast Asia Division during the height of the Vietnam War, and he he was sort of the protector of Sam Adams, the analyst, and they came under enormous pressure to shade the intelligence, and so there was always that dynamic. That that dynamic is always there. If an intelligence organization is doing its work properly, it is telling the powers that be downtown things they do not want to hear, right? Because right. they've got their own a worldview that they want to promote. And the last thing they want is you to come up with a turd to throw in their punch bowl. Yeah, I think that speaks to Gonzalo's um, citing of of Millie uh, and, and how nervous the Pentagon must be at this point because um, he, he came out, well, this was several weeks ago, and said, well, Ukraine is played out. And he immediately <laughs> had to retract that. But the fact that he would say that is, um, I think, a, a, one of those tip of the iceberg mm. data points where something's going on. And, and I think, you know, I was talking about this with uh, Doug McGregor and his, his sense was, this was yesterday, and, and talking about how, um, how much military force we could put in. Let's say that, that 
the administration decided <clears throat> as, as the Russians encircle uh, the bulk of the Ukrainian army that, that we decide that we'll have a coalition of the willing and go in to uh, cordon off part of Western Poland as a kind of ground equivalent of a no-fly zone. And the forces that could be put in, say, between the U.S. and Poland, the U.S. could put in today probably something equivalent to what it put into Iraq in 2003. And the, the Poles could probably do the same, but the, 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 the actual fighting portion of, of those forces would be, would be quite small. And what it, numbers it's are we really, talking about? Well, I mean, you know, combat echelons would be much less than half of the total everything else no, yeah but i mean cool. but how many how many numbers specifically are we talking about well, i guess you could you could do something on the order of two hundred and fifty thousand, but but, but how long probably, would that take to put together well, well that, that, would, that would take six months minimum of six well, months it but, would have to have it properly supported and with yeah. enough ammo and everything and but but the forces are there in theater you know hypothetically we could we could put the people in Together. But but the Poles, for example, have had apparently great difficulty um, with the 300,000 mobilization that they initiated recently. And so yeah. I, I think even the Poles, yeah, even the Poles would be a little skittish about this. And I know that our military is extremely worried about getting into a situation like this, because you know that it would quickly escalate and quickly there would be battles between U.S. forces and Russia. And that yeah. would be... You know, so it, it it it's a very shaky proposition, but I, I that's the exact kind of thing I worry about happening, if it if if it looks as though, you know, the entire Ukraine is collapsing and their army is is surrounded, that kind of thing. You know, is that my thinking has been that the Americans would never really dare go toe to toe with an army because first of all the the time issue. Okay, because we're talking six months, and realistically, that kind of force would be closer to nine months, or perhaps a whole full year of putting yeah. that army to actually be effective in, in in Europe. I mean, it's not a simple matter of putting together a couple hundred thousand soldiers, right? So there's a time no, no, no. issue, yeah, and, and the political yeah. cost would be astronomical. I mean, people would be saying, "Why are we going to send two hundred thousand men to Europe over this, you know, piddly ass little country?" To of fight course. the Russians the people on their home turf, you know, I mean, the, the political issue would be monumental, regardless of the amount of propaganda. And so that's I'm why just, I've always thought that yeah. that they would be more likely to go to nukes immediately, as opposed to putting together mm -hmm. an armed force to, because uh, nukes are kind of like a like a get out of jail free kind of thing. You just hit the button and boom, you know, something blows no, up. I, I'm not sure of that. Yeah. I, I mean, what what. What worries me is that it has been discussed, actively discussed, in in the Imperial Court and the Pentagon, and that was that was a couple of months ago. The whole idea that this should be discussed at all is is kind of shocking. Now, I I think that opinions have changed, well, well, and they don't want to do it definitely, and they will say so because it it it'll be, uh, you know, the last thing the U.S. needs now is straight up defeat going going against Russia. But the the concern I have is I cannot read what the Imperial Court will do when things really break down because people in a bubble don't act uh, rationally when the bubble is popped. And so I'm worried about a climate of hysteria uh, and uh, reflexive rage and all sorts of other things and tremendous fear but you know it can go different ways and and it's going to be extremely hard a to paper over this with more lies and and it's also going to be extremely hard on the uh the blue party with uh, 2024 coming up and and so m much of the reason the administration got into this conflict was because it looked like the rally around the flag effect would would rescue the Biden administration and create a, a bow wave for 2024, and that's why I think they doubled down so much on on you know pushing Ukraine and, and feeding it weapons. But that if that collapses, which I think is highly likely, 
then I, I'm not sure how people are going to respond. And I'm concerned about the response issue yeah. in, in, in Washington. Yeah, that's no, my concern on, as well. On that, right? on that point, um, the United States perception of itself with respect to its military power and capability has been, let's call it a victim of the movie Patton, 1972, was it? Yeah. Um, yes. Because anyway. the reality is the last time the United U.S. military forces were on a battlefield facing an opposing army that had artillery, that had fixed wing, rotary wing capability, that could develop the, deliver, uh, you know, missiles and rocks. That was the Korean War. Yeah, that was not. That wasn't even the case in Vietnam. Vietnam, uh, the, it was only at the very last stages of the war, frankly, when the United States yeah. was out, that the North Vietnamese yeah. regular army became a, a yeah. factor. So since then, we have we've gone towards this small unit, and it was in the aftermath of 9/11 that it right. became this global war terror. Now, I, I've worked with uh, Delta Force, SEAL Team 6, both prior, 15 years prior to the 9-11 and then after. And there was a real demarcation in there. I'll give you an example. Uh, one friend of mine who was a sniper with uh, you know, what they call the unit, uh, Delta, uh, he was on the ground in, uh, in Iran <laughs> when the plane and helicopter collided and it burst into flames in the hostage rescue attempt. He then yeah. went into uh, Delta Force, spent 20 years with the unit, and was never never fired his firearm in anger once. You know, they were he was never in a combat deployment situation. By contrast, I, I was telling uh, Gonzalo just before we went on air, I did a I did a pistol carbine training course with a retired recently retired member of Delta Force, um, and. Just to illustrate, in that training course, with uh, just a civilian with this guy, we shot over right. a thousand rounds of ammunition in two days. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> it, and, it is. And so, but in his experience, he he went into the the unit roughly uh, 2002. He was in over 400 combat missions where he he fired his gun, killed people 400 times. Now, but at no time in that period was he facing artillery was he right. facing rockets missiles uh and having satellite systems collect intelligence on his movements and whereabouts we did all that to the to you know if you will the ragheads the goat herders the camel jokes. right right um and throughout this though the the backstory was you had to promote the enemy we we'll go back into something you said earlier you have to have that enemy in order to justify continuing to expand the defense, our defense budget, as uh, Andre Matianov has written about so eloquently and, and mm -hmm. insightfully, that oh, we are guided by a genuine national strategic defense plan. We're, mm -hmm. we're guided by, hey, uh, what do you want for Christmas, uh, Tommy? <laughs> oh, I'd like a cap gun and I'd like a, you know, a bazooka and can I get a balloon? You know, go out to feed the kid in the candy store without actually supplying what we need to defend ourselves. And right. in the process, we just be this sprawling <laughs> behemoth. We're, we're, we are the military equivalent of Jabba the Hutt, to use the Star Wars reference. Yeah, we, we've, as I was saying earlier, we, we have shorted uh, investment and readiness all, all, ever since Vietnam, you know, and we don't, we don't have what we need. We're, it's not a war fighting force, it's a, showboat force in the case of the navy it's it's a uh, you know it's there to provide um author the authority of american empire without having to fight or to fight in a mostly <clears throat> ceremonial or ritualistic fashion which is what we have done since 2001. That, that's, that's a creepy way to put it that's that's a creepy way to put it you know, I mean, I mean, very well put, but it's creepy that that notion of it's much of my research. Well, ceremonial well, war. I mean, look at look at look at the war well, we're I'm in not, now. I'm not disputing you. I'm not. No, no, I'm not, you. I know you're not. You know, but look at the war we're in now. It is. Um, it, it's based on having some other people, so, uh, some other society, 
endure all the privation and all of the sacrifice so that you can experience a vicarious thrill akin to the kind of uh, epiphany or the kind of sense of ecstatic realization that that great battles of the past have had. So imagine a great battle of Napoleon and you don't want to bleed and die for uh, the, the French empire, but through the proxy, you can experience it in this day and age because we have video games and we have Twitter and you can watch all sorts of awful combat footage and, and revel in it. And because we're providing the weapons and the, uh, the basically the entire uh, conduct of the war is, is on us, we feel that we're there and we're doing it, but we don't have to, to sacrifice for it. So it is, it is a, 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 you know, it's, I call it uh, uh, a kind of vicarity, you know, um, yeah. it's an emotional yeah. vicarity that no, we it's like get. a spectator sport. It, it's like yeah, you're, you're it's, a skater at a football like, game. Right. And you're and, not and taking you know, the hits. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you feel the same sense of bonding with the team you're rooting for. And that's very much the kind of dynamic that we're seeing, uh, um, that we've seen unfold for a year. And, and, and now it's beginning to become clear that, that we, we really quite selfishly uh, suborned these people to die for us. And we're talking in the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians at, at this point, maybe 150, 200,000, maybe more have died. It's, it's, well, it's there, hard. There, to do a quick parenthesis on the, on the casualty figures, that is something that I've been pay, paying attention to. Uh, the lowest figure at this point is 157,000 dead, 157,000 right. AIA. Um, right. And that's the lowest estimate. And it's, it's there are from 40,000. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's on top of that. So they could be dead or captured. Uh, but let's leave it at 157. One source was Doug McGregor, and another was this uh, allegedly a Mossad report that was leaked to a Turkish newspaper. Yeah, I saw um, that. A lot of people are saying that actually it's not Mossad. It was actually Turkish intelligence that leaked it uh, deliberately and, and blamed the Mossad. I mean, you know, blame the Mossad for everything, yeah. right? So, um, and, and so it, it seems to be coming from two different directions, but the same number leads me to conclude that it's basically some hard number that somebody in the Pentagon has or NATO has that they're absolutely 100% on. The high-end estimates has gone as far as I, I heard of KIA, Ukraine side, of 250,000, but I yeah. haven't seen anything that would lead me to really say that's the yeah. real number, as opposed to the Russian KIA numbers. Uh, there are multiple sources, but the most interesting, to, as far as I'm concerned, come from two sources. The BBC, uh, that has been monitoring uh, social media right. and so like scouring yeah. all of Russia and uh, Crimea and the occupied territories for uh, um, you know uh, death announcements and, and memorial services and that sort of thing. And they say that the lowest absolute hard <coughs> number that we have is 12,000 Russian KIA, and that's everything. That's uh, Russian forces, uh, LPR, DPR, Wagner, and Chechens. Oh, yeah, other that's very low. Uh, that's 12,000 minimum. They say it could be as high as 40% above that number, which would keep it under 20,000. And to go back yeah, to I, that uh, leaked report, um, it, they were saying, the Israelis, quote unquote, were saying that it was 18,850 uh, 18, 850 KIA Russian. And then there's a third source from Medusa that that put it roughly around 17 18 thousand so that yeah. that figure yeah. under twenty thousand seems to be the reasonable estimate for russian chaos right well i think so you're talking an eight to one ratio at best which is shocking oh. as far as i'm concerned yeah the thing is what what, what you're yeah. highlighting though is and th this is um this is let's call it another game changer this is really the first war the ukraine war where you've got the, the, the complete marriage of drone technology and social media. Because yes. the, the, I made the point the other day in talking about the casualties. You've got, you, neither Russia nor Ukraine has the ability to control social media in such a way that mothers, fathers, wives, right. girlfriends, cousins can hide 
that you can shut out their message as they talk about right. losing loved ones. And right. you are seeing an enormous volume on the Ukrainian side, but you're not seeing that on the Russian side. So just that in and of itself is a tell, but add to that. Uh, I mean, you know, I've worked, I was working with the Joint Special Operations Command. Gee, I started that in 1994. Mm -hmm. So by 2003, 2004, we had a new television channel on the high side computers. It was called Kill TV. And, you know, we'd call it Kill TV because they'd, they'd say, hey, there's going to be a strike. We're going to hit this. And so everybody would tune into the channel and you'd be watching the drone feed as they'd go in and, you know, blow somebody up. Now, right. I'd seen that, those. Used, that used to be top secret and yes. limited access. Hell, now you're getting it every day on Telegram. I, you know, yeah. there's this video and that video popping up. And yeah. the, 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 this is a new, you know, Lyndon Johnson wanted to control what was going on, on the ground in Vietnam, but had no awareness whatsoever. Now commanders can actually have some pretty remarkable awareness. And I would argue that Russian uh, general staff has better situational awareness of what's on the ground in Ukraine than the Ukrainians. Well, I think an, an, another interesting wrinkle on top of that, I, I just wanted to, to add to that, is that uh, the, the nature of the war and the position that Russia occupies in how others see this war may paradoxically have driven Russia, Russian Federation, to more transparency rather than less, while the opposite has occurred in uh, NATO countries in Ukraine. I mean, Ukra Ukraine is constantly... Um, trying to manipulate its uh, its rulers and the U.S. and and therefore nothing is transparent coming out of Ukraine. And it in fact there are legions of American uh, intel operators, and then of course uh, the, the larger legion of of young men and boys who are engaged in this NAFO exercise, which I find oh, very wow. creepy. You know the yeah. North Atlantic Fellas organization. The fellas organization. Yeah, yeah. I get it that is, shit on is, Twitter all the time. It's just annoying. It's extremely it's creepy, though, in its implications, mm -hmm. and it it suggests, oh, yeah. you know, the imperative to control the narrative on, uh, on the part of NATO and the U.S. and especially, of course, Ukraine has meant that Russia has been in the opposite situation because it finds itself. Um, in a position where it must look better than the U.S. In, in order to maintain the support it's getting from the majority of countries, especially from, you know, India, China, Brazil, uh, and it, it, the favorability rating outside of the American empire is definitely more in favor of Russia, and Russia cannot uh, pull the kind of stunts that the U.S. and Ukraine are. Uh, if it's going to to look like it is the injured party, or at least the more moral party here, so that that's a weird uh, reversal for me to. Uh, no, what's interesting is that what's interesting is that uh, uh, the the American the NAFO, for instance, the NAFO is something that's being run by the U.S. military slash intelligence services. There's a, a a colonel actually, an Air Force colonel who's like a bigwig in this NATO, a uh, NAFO thing, rather, right? the North Atlantic Fellow Organization, which is just disinformation, this, this right? And what, what's increasingly obvious to me is that these kinds of propagandistic efforts to create a false narrative as to the situation of the war, the West keeps saying that Russia is isolated. No, it's the West that is isolated. It's yes. not merely yes. isolated uh, uh, politically from a lot of the other big players, China and Russia and India, but it's it's becoming uh, um, just detached from reality altogether. And, and here's the thing that I, I find just deeply weird, because you see, um, you use propaganda uh, to deceive your opponent, but your opponent knows what's going on on the ground, okay? And you, the only pre people you are deceiving are your own citizens. You're ultimately deceiving yourself. Right. And, and there's no conception as to what is the point of propaganda. And, and to go back to what you, Michael, had, had said in that, in that podcast, which I thought was so brilliant, was that the Russians would have, you know, done a maskarovka of, of you know, of, of dissimulation and propaganda to hide how they were actually doing. 
but the Western propaganda is doing that for them. And yes, so the is. West has this, this false impression that the Russians are failing when the, the very exact opposite is the case. They are winning decisively. And there's also something else, too, that's that's interesting, because, you know, in American football, uh, you know, some of my audience don't watch American football, so they don't understand the game. You know, it's it's basically capturing territory. Right. That's basically what it is. The one team oh, tries yeah. to advance the ball to the other that's side and, and periodically they stop and, and scrum and so forth. Uh, and so the, the West has this notion, the, the Western people are following, have this notion that capturing territory is what matters. Yes, yes, they don't right. understand that. Clausewitz, Clausewitz, you don't care about the territory, you care about the opposing right. army. If you destroy the opposing army, their territory is yours. And that's what the Russians are doing. And, and there's this bizarre disconnect because I've had interactions on Twitter with that's a lot right. of these people who are very pro yeah. um, Zelensky regime and very pro narrative. Right. And they, they don't understand what this war is really about. It's about the right. opposing right. army. But that works for the Russians, and and, yeah, and this exactly. is exactly is because Ukraine Ukraine's strategy in this war is to manipulate us to get mm -hmm. what they need and to get us involved in the war, and and that means that they have to actually fight the war to American popular expectations of what the goal in war is. So if Americans are looking at this like a game of football, a game of inches, then you know. Uh, Ukrainians have to abide by that, and that's played right into Russian hands. And the um, the Moskirovka propaganda aimed at Americans has the decisive impact of unifying the Russian people. You know, when you have some gal in Germany saying in the parliament, we're at war, as she did, right? We're at war with Russia. And then- The foreign have, minister when you have of Germany. With, when you have tanks yeah. with black crosses, and white <laughs> outlines, you know, going in and they have the same names as Panthers and Tigers did in the Great Patriotic War, then you you are perhaps unintentionally, but very effectively unifying the Russian people. And so right. it's it's a strategy designed <clears throat> to defeat. It's a self-defeating strategy. Well, I, I, I look at the, the, the contrast between what the Russians did at Kherson and what the Zelensky regime is during, do, doing, rather, currently in Bakhmut. The, the Zorobikin went on TV or, or went wherever he was, some interview and said, we're going to have to make some tough choices. And he pulled out of Kursan. He saved those 20,000 uh, uh, Russian paratroopers. I mean, they were elite guys. And he pulled them out, lost that territory, but he's got 20,000 fighters who are hardened and good. Whereas in Bakhmut, because of this, this notion that you have to capture territory, you know, the, they, they can't let go of Bakhmut which is just becoming, as everybody calls it, a meat grinder, which is catastrophic for the uh, Zelensky regime. And so the, this, the, the propaganda has created this notion that, oh, the Ukraine suffered, uh, the Russians rather suffered this great loss of Kherson when they just pulled everything back and they lost the land, but they've got the gear and the men. Whereas in Bakhmut, they're holding on to Bakhmut pointlessly at this, at this time and just doubling down with the men and destroying themselves. I mean, it's just fucking heartbreaking. I mean, it really is. I well, mean, let, let me make. I have to laugh or I'll cry, Larry. Well, let me make a point. Let me make a point about propaganda. I've had, I, I had limited experience. I don't want to present myself as a covert action, you know, specialist. I did an, I did an eight week rotation during my first year as a career trainee, on the Afghan task force, working on the covert action, and it was propaganda. But the, this is the critical difference. We didn't have to make shit. We did not have to fabricate things. Yeah, we yeah. were we were putting articles out that were based on truth, that were based on reality. We were not manufacturing an illusion that a bunch of goat herders in Afghanistan were fighting a Soviet army. We right. were manufacturing uh, these butterfly. Uh, mines that were coming down that were blowing off the limbs of children. That was real. So we had to, we would find ways to take truth and fans and get them into as much media as possible. Cause this was, you know, this was the stone age, remember before social media, yeah, where we was. had to use newspapers, 
do documentaries uh, that would go on television and there were a limited number of television channels. CNN had only just started the year or two before. So you use the truth. What we're seeing today is a deliberate lie after lie being sold to people and the ability to actually manipulate truth through social media by banning anyone who actually dares speak the truth as and then repeating this world of lies but at some point as history has shown just as right. Ceausescu in Romania yeah, uh, yeah. it comes it comes crash down reality ultimately catches yeah. up to you that's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm afraid is going to happen because that's practically guaranteed. We, we've set up any cliche will do a house of cards, a Ponzi scheme. I mean, it's all going to come crashing down in, 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 in weeks, probably. I don't know how soon, but I mean, it's it's a kind of a terrifying situation because we're in so much deeper. We're so much more exposed. The situation is so strategically brittle. It, it, we have never been in this situation as a nation. Uh, yeah, I, on top know. of that, the Americans want to pivot towards China and get into a, a war with China by 2025, is it? Jesus well, Christ. We, well, we'll be at war with Let's Iran. Iran. We've got to fight yeah, Iran, too. That's right. <laughs> and, and that is, of course, that, that's Orwell's Eurasia right there. And, uh, you know, we're getting our, you know, getting back to something you said, Gonzalo, about um, uh, the rest of the world rejecting the whole U.S. message. So in, in, in effect, we're also creating a world of blocks by our actions. No, nobody in the what used to be called the third world believes in us at all anymore. They, they're separating out and, and they're, they're, the money is following their convictions. I mean, if you look at, at, at India or, or Iran, um, the, the, the fact that Russia is positioned as one of the BRICs and the BRICs are expanding means that that alternative um, worlds uh, that are essentially isolated from each other is something that we are propelling and, and propelling at an accelerating rate. I mean, the war has been very destructive of the US uh, authority. And, and I, I, I would be surprised if we can maintain even our leadership of NATO when things come crashing down. Mm -hmm. And, and well, the I whole think, idea of your... Uh, no, Go ahead, the, sorry. The, I think the, the, the Nord Stream thing, I think that that is, you know, the, the, the little holes Absolutely. in the Titanic, you know, because it, it'll take a good long while to sink the ship. But those little holes are, are all it takes because, I mean, it really is a, a catastrophe. Uh, let me bring on one of my Patreon supporters to ask a question or, or make a comment. Charles Dew, how's it, how's it going? Good to see you again, my friend. Hey, Marlo. <clears throat> so yeah, so when 9-11 happened, I was actually a junior at MIT. And uh -huh. when I graduated, I uh, <clears throat> had an <laughs> offer from the agency to, to join their analyst branch. <clears throat> so the reason why I turned down in the end was actually because of the uh, recruiter. Uh, um, he was a fellow MIT alum, and he gave me this advice. He told me that the anal analysis branch is like a pyramid, and all of the useful information gets filtered down <clears throat> until you get to the top, which is the presidential briefing. Yeah. And the entire culture is geared towards providing the information that the politicians wanted. <clears throat> so I ended up not doing that, and then <clears throat> I became a uh, IT consultant. And since uh, <clears throat> since then, I've created the basis for okay, no, 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 a I'm new sorry. type of no, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Charles. I, I yeah. understand your project, but that's this is not the opportunity to give it. Do you have a specific question, please? Yes. So I was just wondering, I mean, I would imagine that within the analysis branches, there must be uh, incredible frustration in terms of what they have to do. Uh, would there be any actual organic incentive to adopt an alternative system where they can actually be more effective in terms of creating intelligence <clears throat> that will influence policy in the way that reflects reality? Or do you think well, the political pressures are too much? 
Yeah, I'll, uh, good question. It's, 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 not, it's, it's a function of how it's structured. And I, I don't see the agency changing its structure, uh, but the structure uh, is this. Um, when I was an analyst, the analysts were separate from the, uh, the operation side, the case yeah. officer. <laughs> and the problem for the case officers is you've got really sort of two kingdoms on the case officer side. You have the kingdom of those who go out and try to recruit foreign foreigners to spy, to give the United States secrets that they shouldn't be given. That's good. I mean, that every country does it. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not placing, a moral, placing moral judgment on that. Every, the Russians do it. The Brits should do it. The Israelis do it. So that's just the nature of espionage because you want to know what the other side's up to. But then within the Directorate of Operations, you have the, this covert action branch that de devolves into military operations, support for paramilitary operations under what's known as the Special Activities Division. And so I did see firsthand, because I had done, a, uh, I'd done a, again, an eight-week stint as a reports officer in the Central American Task Force during the, the Contra War, and then I became an analyst. And what happens is because they, the, the covert action part of that is designed to defeat the communists and defeat the Sandinistas, that becomes the priority. And any competing intelligence that would contradict that storyline or undermine that military effort is shut out. A couple of my colleagues in 1986 traveled down to Honduras. They went out to the, the base uh, the CIA base that was in southern Honduras, and the officers are attacked verbally, saying, why are you holding back on this intelligence we're sending? The analysts were like, what are you talking about? So these guys got out and showed them what they'd been sending back. What was happening right. is at headquarters in the Central American Task Force, they were canceling that out so that none of the analysts were actually seeing some of the real intelligence they didn't reflect very, very good on, on the contras. Right. Um, so that was then. What has happened now is you had a merger into these centers. So counter proliferation center, counter narcotic center, counter terrorism yeah. center, counter, yeah. you know, Russia. You know, and so these centers bring the analysts with the operators together. And so take, for example, the center right, which is preoccupied with Ukraine. Can you imagine an analyst having the freedom to walk in to a morning meeting and say, let me explain to you, <clears throat> the, the Russians just called us ambassador into the foreign ministry. And I'm reading this. This is, this is real. The, the Russians said Washington must take steps to withdraw its military and equipment as well as stop hostile anti-Russian activity. Now, that's a threat. And as an analyst, I would present that, say, this means the Russians are serious. You'd get shut down in a heartbeat because that does not, that undermine all of this financial, all this money that's going into this covert action, this paramilitary operation. And people involved with it, it's, it comes down to this. If you're involved with that, that improves your chances of getting promoted. And if you get promoted, you get paid more money. And you can move up the food chain. I mean, it gets as base as that. So the, yep. the era of what I would call having the Dutch uncle who comes in, talk to the president or other policymakers and say, son, you know, you are barking up the wrong tree. That's gone. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, Larry, you, you've said before in previous broadcasts that you think that the only solution to America's intelligence failures is just to go to Langley, Virginia and burn the whole building down and start from scratch, right? To start from scratch. At least the that covert action part of what has been CIA's, I mean, it's one disaster after another going back to uh, overthrowing our Benz in Guatemala and Moshe and, and then taking out the, the Iranian president. Yeah. Uh, most of it. Just, yeah. yeah, most of it. It's been... It's been just one disaster after another. Get rid of that part and then have an operation side that is genuinely committed to going out and collecting human intelligence. I think well, you, you need that. You, but, you'd have to get rid of Victoria Newland, and that's not yes. possible. Apparently. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, they're, 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 I'm just bringing up a, a little um, tangential thing that may be important because when uh, uh, Robert Kaplan came to the U.S. supported by interesting money 
he set about to destroy the Arabist group in the mm -hmm. State Department and mm -hmm. succeeded. And that that left us wide open, not just with 9-11, but with all the contretemps that have gone with it, especially when you're talking about, you know, Arab-Israeli issues. And right. So it was hugely destructive. And you have, so you have evidence of, of a foreign power um, successfully interfering in the course of America's ability to do good net assessment. And we do it to ourselves all the time. So the the ultimate result is is awful. And you have these uh, outside circles that are tremendously influential, which we come under the catchphrase of neocon. And they are heavily subsidized by money of all sorts. And they have disproportionate political leverage. And even though they've created one disaster after another. And I mean, how do you spell Iraq? Uh, it's, it, 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 their influence and power is greater today. And now we stand at the precipice of World War III. So this, it's very remarkable uh, to see that it isn't just about um, things within government. It's also about these external uh, influencers. Yeah, the, the the fascist influence that we were discussing before, basically, with the, the marriage of corporations and government. Larry? Yeah, the reason I was laughing is I was listening to a podcast that involved Tim Weiner. And, you know, I, I think the man's a semi-moron. I mean, he is, his book, Legacy of Ashes, is, is fine as far as detailing some of the problems with the agency. But he got onto this riff talking about the Russian penetration of our intelligence agencies and what a good job the United States is now doing to root out Russian interference. You know, the, the, the role of a foreign intelligence organization is our role is we want to get as many people as possible well-placed in a government so we know what they're up to. We know what their real intentions are. It's designed, that's the essence of security. I, was, I found it amusing that he was fixated upon Russia, defining Russia today as if it was the Soviets of the 1970s. That's right. That's right. And ignoring the fact that the Israelis have greater penetration of our intelligence organizations than the Russians yeah. or the Chinese. Actually, yeah, South Koreans, too. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> no, I mean, one, one could argue that, uh, that uh, Robert Kagan uh, and Victoria Nuland and that whole cabal, one could argue that, uh, you know, uh, are they really in, in, you know, on the side of the Americans or not? Because they have well, this brings up a, this brings to, up an uh, interest. Uh, Israeli intelligence. We have to be careful here because they're yeah. essentially they aren't necessarily, uh, as Stalin would say, moles. They're not burrowing into the rotten fabric of capitalism. Uh, in other words, they, they're self-created and they have a vision of the United States and what it should be, that is their own, but it, it is a destructive vision. And it is, um, and it, 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 somehow they have tremendous leverage on this whole process of, of Vaskirovka that you brought up in the sense that uh, two of the Kagans uh, run this outfit called Institute for the Study of War. And every, mm -hmm. <laughs> Every piece of the narrative for the last year about the war in Ukraine it, it, it references them as the authority. Hey, yeah, all for of those these of you who don't know, the, the, I, just, I, just to do a quick parenthesis to explain the familial relationships we're discussing here, Victoria Newland is the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs at the State Department, and, and many people believe that she's actually the brains of the operation, and Tony Blinken is basically her puppet. She's married to Robert Kagan. Uh, right. who is, uh, you know, comes out of the whole um, American Institute for the New American Century, or I forget the name of the outfit. And his brother is uh, Fred Kagan, who taught at West Point and is very influential in uh, military and geopolitical circles. And Fred Kagan's wife, um, her name slips my mind right now, but her last Kimberly name is Kagan. Kagan. Kimberly Kagan, Kimberly she taught Kagan. at West Point. She taught at yeah, West Point. And she <laughs> runs the Institute for the Study of War. And so you right. have to understand these four people who are all yeah. interrelated and, and personally close. It's not like the Dulles brothers who kind of like hated each other's guts. Uh, these four people, they basically sit around at their kitchen table on a, on a lazy Sunday afternoon and discuss what bullshit propaganda they're going to be spewing 
for the coming it's week. It's not that simple. It's from it's the State Department to the ISW to all the mainstream media yeah. and that reports what the ISDW, the Institute for the Study of War, is saying, which is fantasy land as far as anybody serious is concerned. Uh, and yeah, Michael, they're, am they're, I wrong in this uh, presses of the situation? Their father, their, father, their father was a professor of mine at Yale. And so I knew I knew the senior Kagan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same is true of, um, uh, oh, the name's are slipping my mind, um, but much of the neoconservative movement goes back to the fathers. Yeah. Uh, Podhoretz is one, and um, I, I met Norman Podhoretz. I had a big argument with him. He was telling me that, you know, this is quite a while ago, as you might imagine. He was he was insisting that we should have stayed in Vietnam. We should have won it. And when it comes to Donald Kagan, who's the father of the group we're referencing now, he had a course on the origins of war, and it was very much. Um, following on the narrative, uh, the heroic narrative of good versus evil. And it was yeah. very much in, in, it was kind of an Old Testament view of the need to stop evil. And of course, it highly referenced the 1930s. And I, I think you see a lineage there intellectually. And it, it, it's a very, um, like I said, a very Old Testament uh, narrative uh, and and it, it it's deeply embedded in American culture, uh, going back quite a while. And so there's evil out there. You know the famous John Adams quote about monsters to destroy. I mean, seeking monsters to destroy is, is at the heart of the entire American experience. And it's just that this group of neocons has uh, taken to heart the idea that. Um, that we're on a mission from God and that we must yeah. uh, punish the wicked as well as uplift the oppressed. And th this is run through the entirety of American history. So it, 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 it's an element that probably can't be exercised. What worries me is that it has a kind of not just religious fervor, but it, and, and, and unwavering belief. It, it, it is able to to move um, political forces uh, in ways that realists could never do. And realism is, is, does not have a religious element and, and the religious element is required in American foreign policy. So anyone who makes a realist argument is going to be in a weak position. And, and the few realists that we've had in influential positions, um, Nixon would be one, for example, probably the foremost realist. But they, they're the, the ones who drive us forward are, um, you know, the FDRs, the Woodrow Wilsons. And uh, yeah. it, 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 this, this is very apropos when it comes to NATO expansion, which is the basic cause of the war we're in now. There was never a need yeah. for NATO expansion. And then the need for NATO expansion was the need to recreate our former enemy, the Soviet Union into a new enemy that would keep American leadership at the center of European consciousness. And it, it succeeded uh, up to a point. And that's that's the real issue is when um, NATO uh, no longer thinks that we are doing, we're saving them or securing them or uh, protecting them, then it's going to be a, a, a reckoning for, for this country. Yeah. Let me bring on JJ, who's uh, one of my Patreon supporters. JJ, how's it going? Uh, very well, thanks. I've got two questions. The first is, do you think Five Eyes has been compromised by the Russians? And if so, to what extent? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the second question is, uh, what do you think will be the consequences <clears throat> of all these weapons that have gone into Ukraine that have then gone out again? <clears throat> and, as, and specifically, Going to things, going to jihadi groups. Do you think that's going to be a problem, say, for Europe? Larry, why don't you take the first question? Whether the Five Eyes have been compromised by the Russians? What do you think of that? I hope so. I, you know, from <laughs> from just the standpoint of what, well, if, 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 and I assume Russia has penetrated it. Um, and why I say I hope so is that if Russia has penetrated, then they will actually have 
new insight into the, the mess that it is and recognize that it may, it may not quite be the threat they could perceive if they did have a source inside. Uh, so uh, I think it is uh, the, the Russians, the, the Russians have a much more pragmatic approach to intelligence collection. And they're not saddled with the woke universe. So, and, and this started back when I was in uh, the agency. So in, in 1985, 86, uh, we had a female case officer who wanted, she wanted to go work in Arab countries. Now that's insane because, <laughs> the, you know, unless you're just going to focus on trying to recruit the wives of uh, senior uh, Arab men, uh, the idea of a female American meeting with Arab men, hello, why don't you put a, you know, a red flashing light on their head to, you know, warn about the possibility of intelligence compromise. Whereas, uh, and, and back then, at least the United States could argue we had, we had a sales pitch. We're freedom. We're liberty. We're democracy. We, we have economic choice. We have all these great things going for us. Hey, the roles have flipped because I could see a Russian intelligence officer making the case very much that, hey, we're the country where we have not banned certain political parties and where we do not restrict the press and and and, and force uh, and we don't have as many people in prison as you do. And, you know, they can make an argument that they are actually a much freer society. Well, that's how we used to use that as an appeal to try to recruit Soviets. So coming back to it, I think I think the Russians probably have recruited and do have assets placed within Five Eyes. Yeah. And Michael, to you, the second question about the weapons that have uh, you know filtered out of Ukraine. What do you think? Where do you think that they're going to wind up? I have some views of my own, but I'm very interested in your thoughts. Well, this, this is an American tradition as well. Uh, in, in other words, to to arm our enemies. Yeah. Uh, indirectly and, and sometimes consciously. I mean, you all remember Iran-Contra, uh, but beyond that, look at the enormous cache uh, of weapons that the Taliban uh, secured. And it, it's, I, I think, probably the biggest haul uh, of goodies was by Viet North Vietnam becoming all of Vietnam, of course. And they're still running super tweets over there, the glorious aircraft that it was for close support and equipped with lots of M60s and, and things like that. So this is a, this is a great tradition. I, I think the, the, the New York Times, I don't know how accurate it was uh, intentionally or unintentionally, but they, they had identified that 40% of what we sent over was being sold on the black market. Which I yeah, yeah I, I've seen I've seen websites where the a lot of stuff is being sold or has been sold. I mean, I, I checked it a while ago, but yeah, but this is the, the, there was like javelins being sold and such. Yeah, all the countries that we've supported, you know, originally we were supporting and and all of the weapons the French used in Indochina were American privateer aircraft, uh, you know, um, corsairs. Uh, the aircraft carriers were American. Um, the rifles were still French, but I'm saying, you know, we've always supported either colonial mass, uh, masters trying to hold on to their possessions, or we supported the most corrupt regimes around. And I mean, it's hard to, to, to know what to say uh, about Shah's Iran, but, you know, uh, we, we, we've been in deep with all the wrong people for most of the time since World War II. And that, and that, that was, goes all the way back to Syngman Rhee in, in South Korea. I mean, not that we shouldn't have defended as much of Korea as we could, but it, it was a dictatorship for decades until it began to pull out of it. And uh, same was true of Taiwan, of course. And it's, it's very strange. Um, it's, and yet at the same time, it's, it's hallowed in historical tradition. You know, well, my thinking on the weapons issue is that, you know, CBS News uh, reported and that that report was pulled, that they were saying that only 30 percent of the gear that the Americans were sending was actually making it to the battlefield. 
basically a 70% loss. Okay, so like somewhere between 40 and 70% loss, fine. Let, let's just call it 40% for the sake of argument. Clearly at this point, the people who got those weapons are arms dealers and people who will potentially use them. I mean, seriously use them for some specific purpose. But we yeah. haven't actually seen that those weapons used, but that they're out there, they're out there. I mean, like I'm not particularly sophisticated online insofar as the dark web and stuff like that. And, and somebody sent me a link once and I just clicked on it and boom, you know, with Bitcoin, you could buy javelins, you know, yeah. it was damn funny. Uh, but I mean, funny, tragic, you know, but the point is, I think that um, those weapons are out there. The, the ones that have filtered out of Ukraine that were sent to Ukraine, but never made it to the battlefield. Those weapons, especially I think that the, the, the shoulder mounted stuff, you know, that, that's out there. And uh, we'll probably see it. And we, I, I would not be surprised if over the next five years, some aircrafts, uh, plural, start getting shot down because maybe somebody's on that plane that somebody wants dead. And they, well, this they is, use this the stuff the... because they're selling the stuff for like, you know, I mean, they're not selling it for hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're selling it for, you know, five grand to 20 grand which is perfectly reasonable from, for some mid-level drug dealer who wants to bump off somebody that he doesn't like. You know, so you're gonna have a 777 uh, 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 fall out of the sky because some drug dealer doesn't, you know, wants to settle a score. You know, it's insane. But I think that that might be in the offing in the next five years. JJ, does that yeah. answer your questions? Yeah, that was great. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much for your support. Appreciate it. You know, in some ways, it's the gift that keeps on giving because oh, yeah. <laughs> what's important is that it, it you know, the, 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 the companies that make these weapons get paid and the weapons end up doing some terrible thing, which then promotes more uh, FMS, you know, foreign military sales to the country that was affected by the terrible thing that happened with the weapons that we... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, essentially. Yeah. So, you know, you it, 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 so much of the war is driven by um, military sales considerations. And that includes all of the aid to Ukraine, because even if we give them weapons, quote unquote, for free, uh, that means we have to replenish them. And so you have yeah. a tremendous uh, circulation and, and uh, you know, tremendous profits. But I mean, that's because the military side of our economy is so big at this point. It's, it's an essential part of American economic. Of American economy. Economy. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's a, a final question I wanna to pose to you guys that I've been hearing a lot of talk about how the West should impose some sort of demilitarized zone. They're going on and on and on about how the conflict in Ukraine should be frozen with a DMZ um and that uh you know the the negotiations should be like you know kiev should give up the notion that's going to recapture crimea and the other uh captured territories and that set up a dmz like in korea you know there, there's a yeah. lot of talk about that um now i i, I want to bring this subject up I'll, I'll i'll be the first to post my my views because i don't want to you know catch you off guard and so you have the time to to put your thoughts together my own thinking is that, see, a, a demilitarized zone only arises when the forces are roughly equal and both come to the realization that continued conflict would, as a practical matter, serve no useful purpose because both sides are dug in hard enough and are in sufficient, in sufficient strength to resist an attack by the other but not have enough strength to overwhelm the other, which is essentially what happened in Korea when the DMZ was uh, created there. But in this conflict, we don't have this situation at all. The, the uh, Kiev regime forces are, you know, getting hammered, as, as we discussed previously. And the Russians have loaded up for bear, forgive the pun, I keep using that stupid pun, but it, it just keeps on popping up. They've got, you know, six, 700,000 troops surrounding Ukraine at this point, with the troop concentration that they have in Belarus, the troops that right. they have in Western Russia, Eastern Ukraine, just across the border here in, in Belgorod and in the uh, south and the east where the conflict is going on. So six to 700,000 troops against a rapidly deteriorating Kiev regime force, which is, you know, pressed gaining people on the streets and, and bringing in teenage boys at this point, which is, yeah. uh, you know, unconscionable as far as I'm concerned. But that just shows that we are not dealing with two equal forces. And so I personally think that the notion of a DMZ is this fantasy land. 
what do you guys think? Uh, Larry, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, DMZ ranks right up there with uh, no fly zones. Uh, it is, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great in theory. It's impractical and impossible to implement. Uh, there is a de facto no fly zone in Ukraine, but that is controlled by Russia. Yeah. Russia has not declared a de jure no fly zone, but in effect it is. And, you know, I think you're right that uh, if, if two warring sides have battled themselves into exhaustion and they say, okay, we, we're done, we, let's, just, let's just declare this neutral territory and we'll stop bashing each other's brains in, then, yeah, sure, uh, a DMZ would happen. That's not going to happen. Uh, what Russia has made very clear is that if the United States or anyone else in Europe provides longer distance weapons that hit targets in Russia, Russia will then be compelled to push farther west to remove that threat. Yeah. And the one, the one possibility I see, which uh, is many discount, but if any of these U.S. weapon systems actually hit a significant military target inside Russia, Russia will launch conventional missiles that will hit targets in the continental United States. Oh, Russia is, that. they're not playing anymore. They have made that very clear. And that's what they told the U.S. ambassador. Get your, get your crap out of Ukraine and you get out or else. That was delivered yeah. today. And that, that, was, that was not just a coincidence that it coincided with Putin's speech. So when was when was that Demarche delivered approximately? Today. Yeah. Today? today? Oh, yeah. I didn't I hadn't heard that. That's I, that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I knew I knew the meeting, but not the specifics. How do you know these specifics, Larry? Uh, well, well, I read it on I read it on Telegram. <laughs> <laughs> Telegram is like CNN now, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's uh you know, they're quoting it as uh let me you know, what I read before was, that, you know, they called it. Here's what it says. It was from Dash de Vushka. The American oh, yeah, ambassador yeah, was summoned good. to the Russian foreign ministry. She was protested in connection with the expansion of U.S. involvement in hostilities inside of Kiev. Uh, Washington must take steps to withdraw its military and equipment as well as stop hostile and Russian activity, the foreign ministry said. Wow. So I, if that is correct... That is, that, that's a threat. And it, it's laying it out very clearly for the United States. If you continue down this path, there will be consequences. Because on top, you got the Nord Stream pipeline. You've already, you've already attacked us once. You don't get to keep doing it. It's going to stop. Yeah. I, you know, I, that's my feeling is the demilitarized zone is already known to us. And it will be whatever the rump Ukraine looks like when the war is over. And mm -hmm. um, the objectives are not settled because there are objectives that Russia might have settled for if it were under duress, which is basically the battle line where it is now. But I think with any, any war termination offensive phase succeeding, that the rump Ukraine will um, will be smaller and maybe is, who knows, maybe ab ab about the equivalent of today's Belarus in size, mm -hmm. but it will be the demilitarized part. And then you'll have Novo Rossiya, which I don't know how expansive that will be. It may be as many as eight of the Southern Oblasts. And then you'd have uh, potentially as, as a way of uh, 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 creating some further space is this uh, uh, protected zone that we were talking about earlier, which is the westernmost oblasts, which would be under Polish protection. So if NATO wanted to get weapons into the rump Ukraine, of course, that would be a casus belli, but there would be this protected part of Ukraine that could be in the west, and potentially the rump Ukraine could be in the EU, but there, there could be no way in which the rump Ukraine would be able to rearm. So I think, you know, that might be the essence of a compromise, but there has to be 
I think, graded space between NATO and Russia. And so it can't just be the rump U Ukraine, which would be abutting NATO. There has to be some other buffer beyond that. I'm, I'm just thinking yeah. in terms of something that would work because, yeah. you know, the, the history here is a history of uh, NATO breaking its promises and continuing to do so in an incremental and escalating way. And there will be some, there will need to be a solution if it is a solution, but there needs to be some arrangement that not only everyone can agree on, but that will be workable going, you know, into the future. Yeah. Let me bring on last questioner from my Patreon supporters, and then we'll wind down the show. Randy, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. Randy, I'm just waking up. Yeah, you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I hear you fine. What's on your mind? What's your question for all my guests? I was just wondering uh, how long do you think they can keep pushing into Ukraine and all the other stuff and the different fronts are going when I don't see anybody that's going to want to fight. I mean, I know people that I work with and other stuff that have left the military post haste just because of all the woke stuff and not to mention the four shots that they're just like, screw this and out. And I know people that have kids in there that have been pleading with their kids to leave the military. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So who are you going to get to fight yeah. these wars? And, you know, our focus in our grade schools is, you know, telling boys to loft their dicks off and take hormone blockers. The Chinese are teaching their kids to break down handguns. <laughs> yeah, Larry must have seen that video. That was remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well thanks for your comment. Video was a good one too. Which yeah. one? Larry? So what? Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe. Oh, no. Michael, just, do, do you have any thoughts, Larry, on this? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, um, the, the readiness of the U.S. military, uh, it, it's trying to find its identity. So this this era this era of let's call it the special operations attack groups. I mean, we're the the ops temple for Delta Force, SEAL Team Six, Task Force One Hundred and Sixty, and these other right. units that do what are called advanced force operations. That has ramped down dramatically because where's the enemy? So we're no longer actually mucking around in Afghanistan because there's not a support network to sustain anyone in the field. They're right. largely confined to Syria, and. Uh, sort yeah, of the problem yeah. inherent in there is that much of ISIS comes out of what was originally Iraqi special forces, which we trained. So, <laughs> you know, we we help create create ISIS. So, the, uh, the the number of people I know that are recommending and and and, and backing out of the military uh, is significant, and it, it is the attacks are against the religious patriots because they are the you know the white trash of america and yet they've been largely the ones that would go into these military units and so they recognize now that they're under assault so the the overall readiness of the american military to do anything of consequence on the battlefield is significantly degraded um and i, I i've seen it you know, and I used to be involved with the exercises where there'd be a terrorist incident overseas. You would alert the tier one forces and you'd put this whole big rolling machine into motion and forces would be gathered up and they would be moved forward. And it was, done, it was fairly expeditiously. But that's a whole different ball game from moving a conventional military where oh, you've yeah. got to have armored personnel carriers, you've got to have yeah. tanks, you've got to have helicopters that can provide support, and then the whole logistics train. I mean, that is, that, that's yeah. worse than a circus. So yeah. we're, not in a, we're not in a position where we can do that anymore. And, then, and yet Russia is. Because yeah. Russia, I, I, am, I am completely frustrated and angered by the West continuing to insist Vladimir Putin is an intent in resurrecting the Russian Empire. Countries outside of Russia, the Soviet Union on its borders, did Russia ever go and inhabit? Unlike Germany, France, Italy, Spain, the United States, where we had colonial deposits all over the world. And well, yeah, it is. I mean, we're, throw, we're, we're the ultimate glass house liver throwing rocks. Yeah. Well, you know, there are two uh, senses of the, of the word woke. 
there's there's the way in which we see woke in the contemporary political sense, but there's also woke as in just awakened. And I think that the, our military has awakened very abruptly with the new blue administration and the forceful, aggressive way that the administration has gone to basically begin to dismantle the essential cohesion and capability of the American military. And I think that's one of the main pillars for their anxiety in any further escalation in Ukraine. And um, it, it's kind of like everything is coming all at once on them and uh, there's no way out. I'm, I mean, the, the handful of counties that put Donald Trump over the top in 2016 were counties that had suffered the largest percentage of casualties in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you're alienating those counties because we all, all three of us, and I think everyone listening knows where those counties are and who lives in them. So, you know, you, you're dismantling your military very quickly. It, it's very much like what happened to the American military, although for different reasons. From 1964, when we landed the, the best American military we've ever had, according to you know, colonels I knew back then who were telling me this, uh, to 1972. In between 1964 and 1972, the American military was all but lost. So it doesn't take that much time to lose a military. On the other hand, in a different direction, it doesn't take very much time to build up one of the best armies around. And the Germans did that. They did it from a standing start in 1933. And when they went into the Soviet Union, they had the best army it's probably ever existed. And uh, uh, and the Russians they today. Lost because the army died. You know, the army was yeah. used up in two years. But the fact is, Russia has been fighting for a year. And for all the mistakes they've made, those mistakes have been like, you know, golden eggs because they, they provide lessons for adaptation. And so yeah. I think right now the Russian military, the Russian army and everything else that we would be facing in a in conflict would would just clean our clock because of, you fight for a year and and I can yeah. only offer an example the army of the Potomac which was terrible and it took two years of constant defeats but by the time you get a good leader in, in U.S. Grant and you're invading the South in 1864 you can't stop that army so th yeah. this is something we should consider. Yeah, and by the way. Um, I have a scoop. Uh, I got a super secret memo from Mark Milley's uh, desk, you know, signed by him, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, I got it through, you know, the sources I have. And, and they're advising the combat troops that will be deployed in Ukraine that what they have to do is that they have to just go to the Russian troops and misgender them with their pronouns. And the Russians will just lay down their weapons and run away. And that's how the American military oh, will achieve victory in Ukraine by misgendering yeah. those uh, cis hetero male scumbags who are fighting the war. Anyway, I, with that, I just wanted to add a little note of just, you know, the stupidity and absurdity because this conflict, as far as I'm concerned, it's so absurd and stupid. It should have ended months ago and it could have ended in April as, as, um, What's his name? Uh, Bennett. Bennett, the um, the, the uh, Bennett. former is really, yeah. Uh, his Naftali name is Bennett. Christian, no. yeah, Naftali Bennett. Thank you. Uh, is it revealed that they could have uh, ended this in April with a negotiated settlement, and all this loss of life has been needless. And out of the, out of the, frankly evil, as far as I'm concerned, of yeah. the um, uh, of the Washington establishment. So anyway, we've gone yeah. on two hours. I think I've tried the patience of my guests. And the uh, audience is happy. We've got over 4,000 uh, viewers. Chat, do me a big favor. Why don't you uh, see out my guests with a big plus one, because I think that their contribution has been fantastic. I want to thank, as always, uh, Larry Johnson. You can find him at, at Sonar21. The links are in the description below. Um, and Michael Vlahos, you can find him at his Twitter feed and his website, his blog site, which is also in the description below. I want to thank you both gentlemen. Thank you so much for, for coming on my show and to chat. It's been a pleasure as always, and I will see you next time. And gentlemen, just stick around so I can have a few final words before you go.
Take care, chat.